And of course, I was told over and over again, refrain from the mysteries and set reason aside. And, you know, you get the Martin Luther kind of quotes that essentially argue reason is evil. Reason is against faith. You must throw reason away. You must mm-hmm. just hold the faith, principles of faith. And, and you know, so I might say, now hold it a minute. We're supposedly created in the image of God. Yeah. Okay, but when I look into the animal kingdom, you know, I'm not the smartest person on the planet, but it seems to me I can't run as fast as a cheetah. I'm not as strong as a baboon. I can't swing through trees like a monkey. What what makes me in the image of God? It seems like that's my mind, my ability to reason, my ability to think. Now, Clifton Fadiman, the, the former editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica, once said, tongue in cheek, and God plagued man with the ability to think. But, but you know, it's not really a plague. Mm. He was saying this tongue in cheek, but the plague becomes a plague when we find ourselves facing dogma that's inflexible, that fails to adequately answer questions. Well, well all right. so so back let's get back. Me. So we want to get to how you got back to spirituality after this disillusionment. Well, for a while I was very I suppose I was atheistic in the sense that all those I I I I put myself into the world of philosophy and comparative religion. And uh, as a result of doing that, I became very good at mocking those people who had been my friends formerly, who were also members of the same religion. That's a great way to lose friends, by the way. Uh, But that what happened to me was life-changing. I'm in a tr- in an automobile. Uh, it's late at night. Come up on some railroad tracks. The car stalls. A train's coming. The train hits the car, crushes the driver's side. Loretta, this is all documented, well documented, because there was a lawsuit involved and in, in articles in the newspaper and so on and so forth. The train was doing over a hundred miles an hour. It was pulling like ninety cars. It crushed the driver's side to less than three feet total. The woman that was with me, Connie, said she she had her hand on my knee. She knows I was in the car. They had to cut her out of the car. I don't know how. I don't know why. But I can tell you, call it teleportation or whatever. I don't know how much time has passed. Enough time that there are all sorts of EMTs and law enforcement and and all around these tracks. And they are just removing Connie from the car. They've had to cut her out of the car. Her side of the car is badly damaged, but fortunately it's caused the car to veer from the tracks and the cattle uh, guard has drug it down on the driver's side and then ejected it off it. So, she was injured. That's why the lawsuit, the, the railroad company, the train company paid, the Union Pacific paid uh, for Connie's damages and, and whatnot. They, they were found at fault because of the speed and so forth. But I'm standing in this field and I look and I see all these vehicles and I'm maybe 200 yards away. And then I see him carrying Connie on a stretcher from the car. So I race down there. And at first, they won't let me get near until they discover that I'm the driver. Um, It's a kind of event that you can't explain. You know, science is lost there. Uh, I can't explain it. I can't tell you how it happened. I can only tell you I was in the car when the train hit it period, end of quotation. Uh, I testified to that in court of law and in, in, uh, in this major trial. Um, 
Connie testified. And, and that's, you know, that's what happened. All right. I've since heard many stories, by the way, that we may share later about these kinds of events, because after writing about this, lots of people have written me and shared stories that are equally amazing. Something that I consider to be the white crows that our evidence mind is so much more. So my, my two sons are raised in a spiritual environment, not religious per se. We have visited churches, different churches, uh, especially on occasions like Easter and, and Christmas. They have both gone to uh, a private school. It's Gonzaga Prep here in Spokane. So it's a Catholic school. We've had discussions about Catholicism and and they've taken some of it on board and some of it they've just kind of, you know, yeah, put it over here, but they leave for college, both spiritual, and they both come home atheists. And they come home atheists because I am convinced when, when we decided there was no place for religion in schools, we began implicitly to promote secularism. You can't talk about religion, you can't talk about values. Well, that opens the door to start talking about dogma and philosophy. And I call it dogma, but they call it religion. What happens is you get the scholars who begin to look at religion and look at religion as a sugar-coated neurotic crutch, Freud's words. Or in John Wisdom's words, you know, uh, the philosopher John Wisdom, doesn't it make you feel good? It's kind of like having daddy at the end of the hall when you have a bad dream, right? He can come in and turn the light on. And they begin to mock it. I've talked to so many people in the academic world, and I know you relate to this, who are closet theists. Because in academia, the idea of stepping out and arguing against some of these positions is a great way to find yourself not only not like, but perhaps not getting tenor. Mm. So a mm. lot of academics, like I say, are closet theists. They just, you know, older than so, themselves right. so, so my um, I should let so let me explain um so I I agree with you on some things and not on others so we're going to just um model oh, tell me what you don't agree with please yeah sure. so we're just talking about how people can talk about this subject in a respectful way so first I have enormous overlap with you in the sense that I had the same experience. I was a believer when I started college. And within a few months, it was clear that there was a disrespectful attitude toward religion in college, and I stopped believing. However, I have to tell you that I'm still not a believer. I have more of an understanding of the indoctrination process that I experienced and all the various parameters of it. Um, but I'm still not a believer, but I'm totally uh, a, a fan of anyone who believes should be respected. And I know that non-believers want to be respected too. So non-believers often have this victim mentality that believers are judging them. And then believers often have a victim mentality that non-believers are judging them. Mm -hmm. So our goal is really to say, how can we all be more accepting and tolerant on this issue and on other issues? And um, I totally agree that academia is not ex accepting and tolerant on this issue, despite all of their verbiage about acceptance and tolerance. And in regard to that, you created a word that I think is interesting, or I haven't heard it before, is scientism. So scientism, is just like a religion, as you say, um, but it's using science as a religion. And yes, this is this is very much the experience that I've had in social science. So tell us what you think about scientism. Well, you know, scientism, 
Well, first of all, I'm going to digress. I totally agree with you on what you said. And in no way, shape, or form do I think that an atheist is uh, less deserving of anything than a theist. And I am not a follower of any religion today. That's why interdenominational. Uh, and I know agnostics, I have to, I'm going to put this one in here, and I don't mean it in any offensive way. I don't know personally an atheist because everyone that that I have talked to who says they're an atheist quickly becomes an agnostic simply because atheism takes that position that there is no such thing as a higher power and then condemns a theist who takes the position that there is a higher power when both those principles are unprovable. So it's kind of like my mother said, those in glass houses don't throw stones. It's kind of, so, but I, I have known many people who have called themselves atheists, including Michael Shermer, who are wonderful human beings. Now, Michael, to me, says he's an agnostic, but they're wonderful human beings. They're people I'd love to have as my neighbors. They care about the world. They, they, they're working to make the world a better place. They're contributing in positive ways. Uh, they're, they're people that you just genuinely like. So I, I don't think you judge a person based on their ism, scientism, atheism, or religion. You, a person is valued according to who they are. So with that so, out of um, line, science so me, is well, I just want to clarify. So um um I understand your definition of atheism. I heard this from a friend of mine. She said the same thing. She said, Well, you can't be an atheist because atheists think that there is no God and that can't be proven, so therefore there's no such thing as atheism. So the way I define atheism is so uh, if I believe or I do not believe that's inside me. And it's not about whether I should believe or shouldn't believe. It's like, do I, do I believe or not? And I'm not saying what other people should believe, but for me, I don't believe, you know? So that's all. I'm just speaking for myself. I don't, I, I agree that believers often have healthier lives and I celebrate that. But, and if, if I could get myself to believe, maybe I would, but, but I don't. So, so I, I'm see, sorry. <laughs> I, I would still call you an agnostic okay. because as okay. Carl Sagan said, the absence of evidence is not evidence of the absence. And so, you know, it's a moot point. I, I, you know, good, good. It, so it, anyway, it, scientism, definitional. scientism. So scientism is this idea that we all know that if you are in a graduate program in science, for example, that um, religious people are often spoken of as the enemy. And I know this very well because in my world of, let's call it evolutionary psychology, that yeah. I face a lot of rejection. And everyone assumes that the rejection comes from religious believers. But that's not true at all because religious believers tend to like what I'm doing because they believe in personal responsibility and what I'm doing is consistent with that. So that's why I feel like they're on my side and I'm on their side. Scientism people tend to believe, like you talk about this in your book, that there's no such thing as free will. I don't know how they get from there to there, but then they they think that because I think people should um, create their own thoughts, that somehow I'm blaming people and... So that's anti-science and I, I don't even get it, but, but then those science pro-science people immediately assume that my work is rejected by religious people and don't see how it's rejected by other science people. So that's my life. 